I am up to Rabbi De Dr. Daniel Roth, um, director of the Pardes Center uh, for Judaism and Conflict Resolution based in Jerusalem, Israel, and professor uh, re of religion uh, and, um, and peace building at Bar Ilan University. Bar Ilan University's conflict resolution management Nego uh, and Negotiation Graduate Program, as well as at Tel Aviv University's International Program in Conflict Resolution and Mediation. And the topic, From the Diary of a Rabbinic Peacemaker, Case Study of a Traditional Jewish Process of Reconciliation and Conflict Resolution. This, I guess, is the... Uh the rabbinic uh, section of the of the day. We're going from one rabbi to another rabbi. Um, although we, we, Harry and I just met uh, a few moments ago. Um, I'll just add, uh, Harry talked about the, the 40 mediation and dialogue centers, that many of them are in mixed uh, Jewish Palestinian uh, cities. Um, that's run through an organization that I'm very involved in called the Mosaica Center. And they, the second hat that they wear is actually involved in what's called the Religious Peace Initiative uh, that I'm not going to be speaking about today, but uh, I'd be thrilled to uh, discuss with people further that brings together leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas together with leaders of the religious Zionist uh, right wing uh, in very uh, significant dialogue. Um, I really appreciate uh, the fact that uh, we started off our day talking about the events in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, leaving uh, on a plane from Israel to come here um, to a conference on ethno-religious conflict resolution, which always seemed like something kind of exotic and far away, but I feel like so much of it is really um, at the heart of conflicts that are taking place in this troubled country. Uh, I pray that the wisdom that we learn from each other here can inspire some of the uh, unfortunate uh, situation of hate crimes against Muslims, Christians, and Jews in this country. So um, there was earlier mentioned the book by William Zartman, uh, Traditional Cures, uh, African Cures. Um, yes, that book, when I read it some 15 years ago, had a really big impact on me, um, as well as uh, numerous studies of Islamic and, uh, and traditional Arab uh, approaches to conflict resolution. And I started scratching my head when I looked at that book and I said, well, what about traditional Jewish approaches? Uh, no one had really written about that. Um, and I went on a journey of looking uh, for where are there models that can serve as inspirations for people today, that peace seems like a foreign language to them that can become more of an indigenous part of their identity. And I want to share um, with you one of uh, my favorite role models um, uh, who served as a peacemaker um, as part of my forthcoming book called Rotfei Shalom, which is the Jewish concept of pursuers of peace that existed in Jewish communities um, uh, in different parts of the world. And the rabbi that I want to share with you uh, is a really good representation of a traditional Jewish model of conflict resolution. And I want to explore uh, this one particular case study of the process and comparing it to the Arab Islamic Sulha process, and then talk very briefly about implications for, uh, for the peace process today as well as for, for education. So how do I, okay, I can click this here. Um, the rabbi that I want to introduce you to is, uh, is really a, a hero of mine. Rabbi uh, Chaim Yosef David Azulai, otherwise known as the Chida. The Chida, um, an extremely prolific writer, wrote about 150 books, lived in the 18th century, was born in Jerusalem, uh, spent half his time in Jerusalem, half his time in Hebron. He would be what we would call a Palestinian Jew, meaning he was an indigenous person of uh, Palestine. 
and um, spoke fluent Arabic, as Harry was, uh, was talking about, spoke numerous languages. He, in addition to being a tremendous uh, legal thinker, philosopher, mystic, he also traveled the world um, primarily to raise money for the small Jewish community in Hebron at the time. But as he traveled from one city to another, from Egypt and Tunis to England to Holland uh, to Italy, he took particular interest of how people lived around the world. He met with Christian leaders, Islamic leaders, um, and he took notes in his diary. Um, and he evolved in his own thinking um, about how he saw uh, the world. And he describes in his diary several cases of where he would go into a community, find it uh, full of conflict and not leave until he was, had brought some type of a peace process to it. He believed that the redemption of the world was being held up because of the fighting within different communities. So I want to share with you briefly, um, I'm not going to read this all through. I'm going to do this very, very briefly. So hold on, put your seatbelt on. We're going to run through eight months of a story in about uh, three minutes, OK? The story that I want to share with you is takes place in the Jewish community of Ancona, Italy, OK, um, in 1775. Rabbi Azulai arrives in this city, okay, as part of his uh, as part of his journeys throughout throughout Europe, and he walks into the home of two extremely well off uh, leaders of the Jewish community, and named uh, David and Isaac Cohen, and as he sits down with them, he finds out that they've been in a twelve year conflict. Okay, you can't really see it. But they've been in a terrible conflict for 12 years with their brother-in-law, who he happens to be staying in his house, named Pinchas, and that bishops and cardinals and Christian clergy have all tried to put that situation back together again to no avail. And he explains that the reason is because there was such tremendous hatred that the financial aspects of the conflict could not be resolved. And here I want to take note that in the very definition of how we describe the nature of conflict rests the way we're going to find the anecdote to the illness. And here, Rabbi Azulai knows to identify that the conflict is not strictly financial. It's not just strictly about the scarcity of resource. It's about a breakdown in relationship and absolute hatred between the two sides. And I'm going to argue that because he understood that there's a relational aspect in the conflict that needs to be addressed, he succeeds where others had failed before him. The very first thing that he does after he hears about the conflict is he takes the initiative. That's something very, very um, common as we found amongst different traditional indigenous models of conflict resolution, is that a community doesn't stand idly by when they hear something as seeing it as someone else's problem, but it's part of our problem as well. And Rabbi Azulay immediately goes through, he tells the people, you have to cancel your trip to, to, to where they were going to go in Venice. We're making peace right now with everyone. Um, and he splits in the process very early to get them to sign on between two different aspects of peacemaking within Judaism. One is shalom, as mentioned earlier, which means reconciliation of relationships. And the other is pshara which means a compromise agreement over the financial dispute. And he basically gets the sides to agree upon okay, that they're going to begin to reconcile with one another in the relationship, but they don't want a compromise agreement. They want strict rule, an arbitration process. You are the arbitrator. Don't get us into negotiation. We want to just know the truth, who owes which money. So he takes the initiative, and the very first thing that he does is he knows he's an outsider to the community. He's only there for a couple of weeks. How does he do this intervention? Now, this is not just any old person that comes into the community. He is a rabbinic rock star. Okay, Everyone knows him, loves him, and wants him to be her, his friend. But the first thing he does is he identifies local third-party peacemakers. He empowers those that were with them, those that are with them now, and those that are going to be with the sides in conflict well after he leaves. So he takes together with his team the local rabbi, whose name is Rabbi Israel or Rabbi Israel, and together they go through a process of meeting with each side separately. 
is getting them to sign on to what the framework of the process of peacemaking is going to look like, again, separating between the reconciliation of relationship and between the actual uh, financial clarification of the dispute. Now, it's fascinating to me, and this is something I want to emphasize, as unique in this particular case study as opposed to, as we'll see with the Arab Islamic Sulcha model, is that he argues to do reconciliation first before he does the resolution of the financial and justice aspects of the conflict. And what he does, okay, is the very first thing he does is that he goes and he brings together all of the members of the conflict and their wives. These are all entries of his diary, okay? I'm not going to read them. He brings them into a shared sacred space, the yeshiva or the synagogue that is located right in between their homes that they all are feel connected to. It is a neutral space, but not neutral in the sterile academic way that often Western peace processes uh, utilize. But it is a neutral space in the sense that they all identified as part of their identity. They have common space, they have common identity. And that's the beginning of the transformation that they all love him, trust him. And he describes, and shalom, peace was made. I remember recalling when the first time I looked at this in his diary, I said, that's it? He brought them into a shared space, peace was made, and that was the end of the story? That was kind of anticlimactic. I was soon to find out that this was the very beginning of an eight-month process, that he stayed with the community and would not leave until he changed their relationship. What shalom means in this context is that he simply got them in the room and began a process of normalization of relationship. Okay? But that's, he continues on the Sabbath, okay? He brings them, he go, they're all praying at the same synagogue, and he holds the hand of one, bringing them to meet with the other and say, Shabbat Shalom, peace be upon you on the Sabbath. And then they do literally a walk on the sacred day of the Sabbath around the community. Again, a ritualistic um, expression of normalization of relationship. No one wants to fall out of relationship with him, and they've committed to trying to make peace and separating the justice issues temporarily aside. So he has them walking around, going from part to part of the, within the community. On the, a week later, they're having tremendous success. He keeps on describing this as simply a miracle that these people who never wanted to, they hate each other, are starting to walk with each other. On the eve of the New Year, Rosh Hashanah, there's an entry into his diary where Rabbi Israel, the, the, the junior member of his delegation, says, let's go out and make more peace. We're doing, we're like on a roll, we're undefeated. We want to keep on making more peace. And he says, no, 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 I have to do silent meditation now. And it's fascinating that he shares this in his diary because he says the peace actually stopped and was jeopardized for a brief moment. And they were unsuccessful because they tried doing it without him. But what's interesting here is that he's describing something that I think is often forgotten that the need to preserve inner peace and, tra and, and balance as peacemakers in our pursuit of trying to save the world sometimes we sacrifice our own well-being which leads to burnout and ultimately failure within peace processes and that he, 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 um, he demonstrates also when he talks about how much time he allotted to this peace process that he continued to find time to write his book okay uh, as I said he wrote a lot of books and argue with his junior uh, study partner where they describe arguing in, 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 a, uh, in, in love and, and, uh, and, and mutual respect as they found out 70 different lawsuits including financial uh, disputes. This is an extremely complicated, ridiculously um, uh, ridiculous conflict. Um, there's an entry here in November. We're already three, four months into the conflict where he describes this beautiful scene of a niece of the two family members coming from a different city and the family members of their own initiative creating a, a, um, a pretense for having a family party. And they start drinking and toasting one another. And he's not doing anything, but he's watching them reconcile in their relationship and he describes how terribly uncomfortable he was at this lavish party of you know w wealthy Italian uh, Jews as he's this very simple kind of person, you know, you know, describing himself a bit of as a, as a nerd talking only Torah with his, with his friend, but he knows that he had to be present because the very presence of his, of his being was encouraging them to continue to reconcile without him having to hold his hand. 
But all of that, however, is before they get to the actual conflict resolution process. All that is reconciliation. He's warming up the relationship. But when they finally get to December, it took them several months. They've worked through the 70 different cases in conflict. They've worked through all the financial issues. He gets to a point where he has a verdict. And he has it written down. And he starts trembling, as he describes in his personal diary, that he knows that if he hands over the verdict, he is going to blow up and destroy all the relationship he's, so, he's worked so hard to cultivate. And he has a dilemma. And he decides that instead of delivering the verdict, he is going to postpone his trip away from his family for another several months and convince the group in conflict to actually transition from strict law to pshara, to a compromise agreement. And he describes how God helped him. And if it was not for the fact that they had already started warming up the relationship, they would have never entertained now shifting in how they look at the justice issues. So he succeeds in bringing them to a compromise agreement. Um, it takes him again several months. We're already in March when he finally hands over the, uh, the, 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 uh, the compromise agreement. He's worked through the justice issues. March 23rd, um, I'm, I'm going to skip a little bit even more. He describes in detail how they have everything worked out, but they have to make sure to do the, tr the ceremonial oath. They have to swear at the exact same second. God forbid one swears before the other one. The whole thing <laughs> will be gone up in, in flames. Um, and again, he praises God over and over and over again. That's giving him the strength and the patience to work through this ridiculous communal uh, conflict. And then finally, um, we are in April. Okay, He describes how the financial agreement was brought to the uh, papal court at the time uh, the pope was the, uh, the, the uh, uh, political leader of Ancona, Italy. And he describes what a sanctification of God's name it was when the papal uh, scribe literally writes that all of the king's uh, horses and all the king's men, including the pope, tried to negotiate this conflict and couldn't put it back together. And then this one rabbi from Jerusalem came and somehow he did something magical and made peace between them. And he felt, you know, he wrote that in. He's like, that's kind of cool. I got a shout out in the, uh, in the courts of the Pope. But I think, and then at the end of the story, they have, uh, where, they, where they all sides of the conflict actually escort him out of the community and, and, and bringing him to the next community, where of course he then found another conflict, but didn't thank God take him eight months. But it did take him uh, a few weeks. And he went from community to community doing this. Now, I want to, uh, just say two, uh, a couple of quick points in comparison to the Arab Islamic uh, model, uh, the sulha process. The sulha process, which I assume many of you are, are, are familiar with, um, um, there are numerous similarities. We're talking about a well-respected uh, lay leader, or sometimes it could be the jaha, or it could be the imam of a well-respected religious leader who plays the role of the third side. Um, they go back and forth until the parties are ready to meet. But one really interesting difference that I just want to note is that traditionally in the sulha process, the two sides in the conflict are forbidden to have any kind of social interaction until the justice aspects are resolved first. Until the atwa and the dia and the different reparations have been made, the two sides are, forb are forbidden to have anything to do with each other. It would be considered an actual um, insult to the honor of the other side if I am socializing and normalizing with them until there is the justice resolved and then there is a ceremonial uh, sulha process where they all come together and gather and reconcile publicly. Here, Azulai does that process as well, right? Sulha is not particular to the Islamic community. Christians do it and Jews such as Azulai would do that. But here what's interesting is the flexibility that he didn't stay rigid to the model, but rather he said, in this case, if I insist on first bringing them to a compromise agreement that resolves the financial and the justice issues, they're never going to sign it, and they're going to stay for years and years stuck in conflict. Rather, I'm going to first work to reconcile them and then bring them from that place of trust and lack of hatred or reduction in hatred then they'll be able to be more willing to engage in an actual compromise agreement around the financial justice issues. 
this has very significant ramifications in my mind in terms of how we, percept, how we conceptualize peace um, and the relationship to justice today. And I want to give a shout out to a, a great article that's talking about religious peace initiatives within the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by Yvonne Wang. Okay, Yvonne Wang makes a really nice distinction between what we call cultural peace building and structural peace building, which I assume many of you are familiar with. But in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the argument is between different peace NGOs where structural peace building argues norm normalization between Israelis and Palestinians or Jews and Muslims until there is a formal peace agreement. That's very much in line with the traditional Sulcha way of thinking of things. And indeed, many Palestinians who are living under occupation will argue not to have normalization, don't have ultimate frisbee, don't have you know, uh, some kind of reconciliation of relationships until justice has been resolved. Cultural peace building, which many Israelis uh, feel more comfortable with is let's first reduce the hatred, change the textbooks, change the relationship, and then we can talk about how we're going to figure out to sign a peace agreement when people stop hating and educating to hate. These two methods, okay, um, are in direct conflict with each other about how, what does it mean, peace and conflict resolution in the context of the conflict. I think what's interesting here, again, is that culturally, traditionally, religiously, you have different models that we can't be so uh, certain about which one is the correct one to work with. And I think this particular case study represents an interesting example that may support, in this case, that the hatred was so great that no ability to bring them first to an agreement and then to reconciliation can actually be worked out. Rather, Azulai represented the need for what we, I would refer to today as a cultural process first, transform relationship perception of other and hatred, and then be able to bring to an agreement. But I raise it as a question, not to say it should only be one way or the other, but I raise it as a question. Um, and it's interesting to think about the cultural context as well in terms of what is peace and when does it come in relation to justice. The final thing I want to share is that I actually use these stories that I've researched um, in integrating them with contemporary theories and methods of conflict resolution in programs that I've done with schools and training rabbis called Rodfei Shalom programs, pursuing a peace programs, um, training rabbis to have them actually study these stories as, as role models of inspiration, of engaging in peace, asking them how they would engage if they were in this case and what are the ramifications for, for, for their peacemaking today. And I'll just share, um, right before I left, I have uh, um, I met, we just started our semester, I have about 50, 60 MA, PhD students um, in one of my courses on religious uh, and cultural models of conflict resolution. And a young, uh, very orthodox Jewish woman came up to me. And I could see that she was a little bit squirmish with the whole concept of you know, religious peace building. It was kind of foreign. When she saw Rabbi Azulai on the syllabus, she knows him. She, he's a family hero. There no, she, said, she said, can I be the one who gets to represent this in the class and kind of um, and, and, and be able to address this deeper. And I realized that there was a connection that was made, that this is not theirs. It's not the UN. It's not the US. It's not someplace different. There's something very indigenous about how Jews have been making peace. And to understand that and compare that to others, I think, is an important role model and inspiration uh, for, for um, promoting more, um, as we say, cultural and, and structural peace building in the future. Thank you very much.